Hello and welcome to uh, Answer Broadsheet Reader. My name is John Ryan. I'm with Broadsheet. Uh, we're joined tonight by uh, Helen O'Rahilly, uh, who is the author. Hello, Helen. Hello. Hello. Um, Helen is the author of The Sterlet to Sends, uh, Tweets from a COVID Cocoon, uh, which tells the story of, uh, relates in twi tweet form how returned emigrant and former BBC and RT executive Helen O'Reilly, cocooning with her 90-year-old aunt, Monica, survived the first months of the pandemic. And the book is hilarious, and it's literally taken from, the tw taken from Twitter, basically. We're, stories ripped from the headlines, but from Twitter. That's correct, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it didn't start out with a book in mind at all. It was uh, a bit of a diversion for me um, during the lockdown. Let's face it, we were all looking for things to do when we were all cocooning and um, you know I realized as my life was sort of reduced to this tiny little cocoon up by the north coast of Dublin that the funniest things were the chats I was having with this incredibly feisty determined uh, 90 year old as she was then she's now 91 and um, I, I st with her permission she said now don't be putting a photograph of me up on that she called it twatter twatter yeah, I think it's a very apt name actually, Twatter. <laughs> and um, and uh, don't put my name, don't put my photograph, but yeah, you, I said, you're coming out with gems here, uh, most of them at my expense. And um, so I started to post the odd, only when she came out with stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and I hashtagged the, the stairlift ascends because she'd usually save the best comments till the end of the night till she was going up on this sort of ancient creaking stair lift which is about 12 years old and it's you know my mum died last year so it helped my mum up the stairs for years and it's continuing albeit more slowly and more creepy it's a bit like r2d2 it sort of sends out pings and dings you know <laughs> so she'd be creaking up the stairs at night and i'd be just going oh, relax now and having my little snifter or something and next thing was there'd be a call out saying don't forget to just wash those bins now or something really trivial and you know deeply sort of boring and domestic but i would just sort of sit there going mother <laughs> of god you know the stair lift descends you know and it just kind of took on a momentum i think it related to a lot of people who were stuck with with elderly people or carers who dealt with people and it suddenly got this great following and people were asking, you know, what did your aunt say today? What did your aunt say today? I said, I'm not measuring these, you know, I'm not producing these. I have to wait till she comes out with it, you yeah, know, yeah. and then I'll, <laughs> I'll tweet. Because I wanted to, so there's nothing added, nothing gained. So it might be, well, there might be one a week, there might be three a week. If we went out for a, a big shop in her favorite department store, there might be six a day, you know. So that's how it started. And it kind of built up over the summer with all the, vagaries of the lockdowns and abating and then coming back in and so forth and um really it just came to a head the last few weeks when people started saying are you doing something for christmas on this i, I started i literally googled self-publishing i had no <laughs> idea how to do i know I, I was i was thinking you know maybe i'll just photocopy them and staple them and send them out in A4. I mean, talk about analog. <laughs> you know, staple them, put them in an A4 envelope, and if 10 people want them, I'll send them out. And um, I had a phone call from a Twitter follower who turned out to be, this is the magic moment, Ivan O'Brien, the boss of O'Brien Press, one of the biggest uh, publishers in Ireland. And he said, Helen, this is a mad idea. This is mad. Uh, but uh, he said, most Christmas books were done in July, ready to be sent out in July. This is... November. So this is crazy. He said, but if you can get me all the content, all the tweets, all the texts and a bit of artwork and get them over to me in 24 hours, I can book a, I can book a printing slot and we will get something made. Wow. And I was like, wow. Okay. And I, I kind of almost didn't believe it as I was doing all of this. And it were, you know, it was published within a week and then it was pre-ordered and it was the highest pre-order ever they've had. Yeah. And uh, the bookshops were closed at that stage and now they've reopened. So he gave me the figures today and it's already flying up. Um, it's already flying up the charts and we've lots of bookshops where it's already sold out. Nice. Um, uh, and uh, tonight, actually, just before I came on to you, I've been asking my Twitter followers, let me know where they'd run out or hadn't got them so we can fill the gaps in, you know, 
So yeah. I'm I'm completely just absolutely bowled over by this, you know. It's yeah, fantastic. it's incredible. And uh, at what point did you think, oh, there's a book here? I didn't. Uh, well, I, I mean, did. at what point did you feel that there was more to it than just uh, random tweets? I genuinely, or up until when I was just thinking, I'll a few people have asked, I'll photocopy them and send them out in A4 envelopes, and that was. That was probably a month ago. Uh, I had no idea how to go about it. I mean, I'm, I, I'm good in one section of the media. Publishing, forget it. I've never published anything. I've never dealt with publishers. Don't know anything about, you know, distri yeah. distribution. Didn't know all that, any of that. Ivan basically said, leave me to deal with all of that. And uh, we'll, we'll get this. You know, it's a classic stock and filler. It's not Beckett. It's not Joyce. It's a no. Christmas stock and filler. And it's a lovely little slice, as he said, of kind of, Irish social history in this mad year, oh, you yeah, know? completely. Well, it's sort of Beckettian in a way. I mean, there's, a, there's moments of sheer, sheer bathos and pathos and yeah. whatnot. And... Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't uh, stop from putting in some of the more poignant ones, you know? Um, she, like, my aunt called, uh, my aunt lived with my mum for years out in their village in North County Dublin after my dad died. And they were like that. They were so close. And she looked after my mum, uh, who was called Emer. And um, occasionally, you know, we were all kind of, all our he heads were befuddled in lockdown and so forth. But as she was tired in the evening, she'd go up the stairs and she'd say, good night, Emer, to me. Uh, and my heart would kind of, I'd have to take a gulp, you know. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't check her. I'd say, good night, good night. I don't think she thought I was her sister, but it was just her, her name is obviously there. And, but it would take all my strength to sort of not uh, break, you know, have a little yeah. cry, you know. Yeah. Um, but so there are, there are things like that in it, not, not to sort of, just to be honest, really, because we all know that COVID isn't a hoot. It's not a hoot, it's, it's a pain in the arse. And some days with her are incredibly frustrating. <laughs> uh, I'm sure she finds me incredibly frustrating. Um, and it's kind of about how we have kind of tried to balance out the weeks and the days as we've been so close to each other, literally cheek by jowl for months. And then I bought a house in Dublin and I moved out and then it's been phone calls. I go to her every day. I'm her main yeah. carer. Now you're, but, she's in, are, are you, uh, um, Monica's in Rush, is that right? That's oh. right. Yeah. Yeah. She's lived there for, for nearly 30 years. And Eva, your mother, lived there. Are you? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I bought a house um, near the centre, centre city, um, back in March. Couldn't move into it because of lockdown. Okay. Uh, so gave, gave the keys to two um, Irish medics who were coming back and had to isolate and couldn't go to their own house. And basically said, "Here, have the house," Great. because I couldn't couldn't do anything with it. And they were like, "Oh, fantastic!" They were from Mayo and uh, Sligo. And they couldn't stay with their families, a physiotherapist and a nurse. And they both worked in Dublin hospitals and had jobs, but they had to wait the two weeks before they could, you know, isolating. So, um, so I didn't have the house. And finally, after the lockdown lifted, I started to move back to, to just to move into my house. And now, um, so I go up and see her, uh, spend a few hours, do a few DIY, do her shop and do everything like that. And then luckily come back and have my own nice space here and be able to to uh to, to have a bit of a life here yeah um i just wanted to there's a photograph here in the irish times that i just want to show uh, or share with readers sure um there she is uh, uh, i don't want to sound passionate very very elegant woman uh she is indeed she's that that's her best uh that's her new jumper we got on a the rare the one and only trip to kill their village this this summer, she she rang me at I think it was seven o'clock in the morning. She'd obviously seen something in the paper saying that Kildare Village was back open, yeah. and I was I was <laughs> the phone rang at seven. I was fast asleep, and she goes, "I want to go." She doesn't need to say good morning. She goes, "Helen, I want to go to Kildare Village." And I'm like, "What? What? What?" I said, "It's seven o'clock in the morning," I, and luckily I had just remembered that you had to book a parking space at Kildare Village, so I put her off. I said, no, no, I'll have to book ahead for that now. I can book for the week. So she said, all right, well, I'll, I'll put it down that we're going this week. So she, by all, she keeps, she keeps the diary, you know? Okay. So um, we had a, but we had a great day out in Kildare Village and we had the coffee and everything and she had the mask on 
and um, she was hanging on to my arm and everything and and then gives out to me about my dreadful fashion choices while hers are impeccable you know right. so she keeps me you know for all we talk about elderly people needing of course they need care they're they're old and they're fragile but my god she has kept me going genuinely and i say that not not to be patronizing she has kept me going you know yeah. with just yeah. the laughs and the cutting remarks the time when she poked the bag from arnott's and uh, you know, she's a size eight. She's a sliver. She's a sliver of a woman, you know, very fashion conscious. And she sees this galumphing me come back in. And I put, she said, what did you get at Ernest there? Poke my bag. And I said, oh, just a couple of pairs of sloggy knickers, you know, sloggy, the brand. Sloggy. Okay. She just looked at me. And without even that, she just went, I didn't know they made them in your size. Oh, Jesus. Do you know what I mean? And she's no filter. She's no filter. But yeah, she, yeah. Didn't, she didn't mean it cruelly. Yeah. It's just a factual sort of, oh, and I went, oh, right. Yeah, thanks for that, you know? <laughs> so you have to have your wits about you. you know? Yeah, I mean, well, a lifetime of, of people being polite around each other and suddenly, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's very refreshing. Now, Helen, I know that you have, um, you're sort of autoimmune susceptible as well, aren't you? So... I'm not autoimmune. I had, uh, when I was in London for 30 years, I, so I was four years ago, out of nowhere, I got uh, double pneumonia. Right. Uh, and I ended up, I uh, started off a bit breathless at home in North London, thought this is weird, and then thought this is really weird, I really can't breathe properly, got an ambulance, um, went to the normal ward, and the next thing was there was a lot of activity around my bed, and my brother's a professor of medicine in Cambridge. Yeah, he's, so a, nice, he's a, he he's a nice, yeah, a knight of the, a knight of the realm, and uh, I had him on the phone, and he said, okay, you're obviously having a severe respiratory, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So the uh, next thing was, I was down to, I think it was 89% oxygen saturation. Anything under 94% is dodgy, so 89 is pretty serious. So I ended up in the high dependency unit in my London NHS hospital, about to be intubated, as in about to have what everybody worries about with COVID, you yeah. know, made, made unconscious and a tube put down my throat. Lord. And I begged them not to do that until my brother appeared. Um, and, and I actually gave my will, wrote a will, well, not wrote it, but spoke my will to the intensive care nurse. Good Lord. That's how really? close. So that's why I'm acutely aware of this COVID thing, how dreadful it is not to be able to breathe. Uh, and I say to people, it's like, um, imagine trying to draw all your breath through the tiniest, not even a McDonald's straw, a tiny straw, and you're trying to suck through that tiny straw. I said, that's what's having, you know, a, a respiratory illness like COVID uh, yeah, is. Yeah. And so I've, I've been just as much as protecting a 91 year old frail woman. I didn't want to get that again, you know? Oh, no, no. So everywhere we went, we were, and the rare, the rare times we went out, we were masked. We had the hand sanitizer in the car, washing hands all the time. And thanks, thank God we, we, we survived up to now, you know, um, uh, avoiding it but uh, it, it was it has been an incredibly worrying time and until really we have the vaccines um she'll get one first i may get one as her main carer but um i'm you know we're still sticking to the sticking oh yeah yeah, the yeah, yeah. Moves, you know there's a buddy system but i think that's just for the care homes isn't it I think, that's uh, right yes yeah um now i'd love to keep on chatting with you but I, the, this broadsheet readers have these questions that they asked uh, yep. that they wanted you to answer so there's they're not um they're a cheeky bunch you know the oh readers. i know them i know them yeah why has she got a dalek in her photograph that's not her aunt <laughs> yeah yeah something like that yeah. <laughs> things like that you know yeah. so i'll just share this one second and uh hopefully now um you'll be able to see this see the questions as i see them okay uh can you see that uh, I'll skip. Da, da, da. Okay. I can see, yeah, I can see the page, yeah. Okay, um... It's Die Hard, a Christmas film. <laughs> <laughs> Helen? That's been doing the rounds, yeah. <laughs> Is Die Hard a Christmas film? What do you think? If you were a controller of RT now, would you put Die Hard on on Christmas Day? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Is The Thing a Christmas film? That's... I was with Steve McQueen back in the... The 60s. thing, I listen. I always think horror films are great at Christmas. I mean, you're there sprawled on a sofa late at night. So long as it's after the watershed, anything that tickles your fancy is good. You know, I put, you know, BBC used to commission 
a big scary drama every 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 Christmas. You know, a, a rerun of say Sherlock Holmes, The Hound of the Baskervilles, or something like this. I think horror is a great genre for Christmas myself. Yeah, well, okay. So the thing that this is a bit, this is less. Uh, um, from the sublime to the kind of like the serious here. We're, yeah, Helen, what's it like working for Auntie? <laughs> and not, 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 not Auntie Monica, uh, knowing no, you're part of the Forever Ward propaganda department. Can you comment on the Radio 4 documentary series May Day in light of the producer's refusal to answer questions from Aaron Maté about getting some of the most basic facts from et cetera, et cetera. It's not really about your book. <laughs> no, I don't um, mind. I, you know, okay. Uh, you look, look, I don't work, you know, you get this all the time when you when you have worked in the BBC. I have not worked and do not work for the BBC anymore. I'm back being a carer in Ireland for the last year. So, uh, you know, lots of people have strong views about public service broadcasting. You get it about RTE, you get it about BBC, and they expect you to know every sort of, you know, every every nuance behind every single ounce of content across a national broadcaster. I, I simply, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, if, if that's their view of uh, the BBC, I don't think whatever I could say would change them about that. Okay, well, maybe for a day, we, maybe we'll have a chat on a, on a different day about, about yeah. some of the stuff. Uh, somebody has uh, bitten boxy, has written uh, such a beautiful broadsheet comment, gather all you conspiracy folk or those with next grudge to grind. Um, <laughs> Pappy writes, could you also pour me a small Jameson? That's, that's... Oh yeah, your... I've got one. I've got one. Oh, yeah, lovely. Uh, that's... Bit of seven up in it, yeah. That's Monica's... Um, that's Monica's drink. medicinal, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, and was it, was Emer and Monica, were they, would they have had a few Jamesons together? Not at all. My mother wasn't a drinker at all. Mona has mm. a tiny one every kind of... Every time I remind her, basically, and say, would you like a little whiskey? And she'll go, ah, sure, I might as well, yeah. <laughs> but then uh, when I was there, you know, the usual was she'd shout in from the front room saying, um, uh, Helen, Helen, I was convinced she'd fallen over. And uh, then I'd run in and she was sitting there with one of my cats before I moved the cats down here. She had one of the cats on her lap and she'd just go look up at me sweetly. And she'd say, could you pour me a little Jemison, you know? Such manipulation going on, you know? Yeah, me sure. with my heart thinking, oh God, I'm, have I got the number for the, for the doctor? Have I got, the, you know, anyway. <laughs> I, think the, so, I, I think the stair lift is a perfect one for the, la the last word. And just as you leave. Yes, you know, as you... yes absolutely. Yeah. So Norma Desmond in reverse. It never, it never quite, she caught me out a few times, to be quite uh, honest, because um, you'd hear it going up, but you'd also hear it coming down about half an hour later, just when you were getting relaxed, you know. <laughs> so I'd, have to, I'd have to be back on my metal again to be able for her, you know. <laughs> You should have got your uh, rival one uh, on the other side of the banisters. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Oh, they're, they're talking about Jemison. The only thing Jemison is good for is selling it to the Americans. Uh, oh. Jemison is grand. It's a grand little snifter. I won't have anything said against it. Okay. Um, similar to top blah, 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 yeah. Jemison. Um, oh, I'm reading this one now. And here she stayed at RTE for six months. That's interesting. Gave out to everyone. Screamed patriarchy with everyone and left. Zero impact from the BBC Mavens. I'm surprised she didn't write a book about that. <laughs> that no, I'm fine. I, listen, this is fantastic. Listen, mate, whoever you are, Toby. Hey, Toby. I, That's from Toby. I, He's in there. Look. I stayed for a year. I got more thanks for the, pe the people in there at the creative level for having been there. I helped get them win a BAFTA. I didn't scream at anybody. I introduced digital camera technology so that assistant producers and researchers could go out and film their own stuff. And in fact, I got emails from the unions thanking me for my interest in putting through a partnership thing. So for the fact that I stayed there for a year when I was then offered a, a, a job back at the BBC, I'd love to know who this Toby is, where he's getting these, I mean, you know, mother well, of God, do your research, mate, you know, please. Well, well, it, I love, the thing is, I still love RTE. I love a load of people still at it. A lot of people have left. There's a whole new, a whole new section of management in there. A whole new range of better practices that were yeah. there when I was in charge of television so long ago. And you know, this is you know the BB, the, the, the RTE that I was dealing with at that time is not the RTE of now. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, um, again, there's probably another interview here, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which we will, uh, hang on a second. Um, 
Oh, but I don't mind taking on these questions, you know. No, 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 gladly. I knew, I knew you wouldn't be. I mean, no, I, I, you know, I haven't spent 30 years in, in, in uh, the TV. You know, as I, as I said, you know, I've had guns, a gun drawn on, on me by a member of the Mafia. I've had a Rottweiler set at me. I've had a chain wrapped around my neck. Good people, Lord. People so sounding off on weird, you know, tax on what, what my career has been. You know, you don't frighten me, mate, you know. Well, um, there, there, is, was, there was something I wanted to ask you, just not on the patriarchy front, but you, you said that, um, I, hope you, I hope you don't mind me, but you said when you came out in RTE uh, in 2000, that there was a, there was a strain, there was a, it wasn't a, a very warm atmosphere. That surprised me, I must say, because I thought RTE was. Uh, well, a, again, no, I, there, was, there was no coming out about it. I mean, you know, it was no great revelation. Yeah, I mean, no. I was, yeah, I was hired, and uh, th what the subterfuge was was uh, was a weird small collective of narrow-minded people who thought it was okay to get a security guard to break into my office to try and find a photograph of my partner oh. and to photocopy it. Um, a management person, by the way, a management person who thought that was fine and dandy behaviour for a senior manager to do. Um, so I had to put up with that. Okay. Now you put up a lot. You put up a lot in RTE. You put up a, a lot in 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 various institutions. It's not just RTE. And look, we're X years way beyond that now. We're five years beyond the marriage referendum. Yeah. Things are better. They're not perfect, but you know that would not and could not happen now. I hope in other organisations. But even, you know, that was a shock to me, having worked in the BBC, yeah. to, to have endured that treatment and to not have it sort of acknowledged. It was acknowledged a few months after I left, actually, when it got very sordid in terms of certain individuals had been accused of sexual harassment of people, and yeah. it ended up in the papers. Okay. And somebody was secretly recorded, uh, pretty much nice. create a libel against me. We won't go for any okay. further than that. Christ, but, okay. um, but when they played it to me down the, fo down the phone to me in London in the BBC, I just got my solicitors in Dublin onto them and the person, inverted commas, left RTE. So, you know, everything was kind of hushed up and quiet and everything, but it was a horrendous, sort of, you, I mean, I'm completely useless and waste of energy and space for me to have to deal with, you know? Um, but you think, when you look back at it now, you just think, what on earth? Go and do some work, you yeah. know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go yeah. and do some bloody work. Okay. You're paid by the taxpayer. You're paid by the license fee to work, you know? So that was my annoyance, is that some idiots had had this sort of agenda. Okay, and, but, and, and, and the, the charge against you is, well, you're, just your sexuality? Or, 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 yeah, they did no, okay. no, and the fact that I was, uh, you know, a... a quite, you know, happy in there, uh, uh, wanted to come back, wanted to make changes, genuinely wanted to make a difference at RTE. My sexuality didn't matter a damn to me. Uh, no, no, was no. Nothing about, you know, it was their problem with it. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a problem to me, uh, but they would do their damnedest to make sure I had the hardest possible job. Right. Uh, and, you know, and they tried their best to do that. Um, and then basically BBC rang up and said, look, we'd like you to run our digital channel. Would you like to come back to London? And thank God I'd kept my London house. Um, and I said, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Because I thought one person can't change an organization. No. One person can't. Even if you're a director general, you can't change an organization. You know, I think Dee Forbes is, it, it has been trying and doing her very, very best. I think she's made some great inroads. But unless you have really supportive staff around you, you're not going to be able to, to change such an ingrained culture. Yeah. And I realized that I'd, I'd given it a good go. I'd got some really good wins. And I was now going to go back to the BBC, back to where all my friends and everybody was, and, and actually be able to be creative again, rather than spend all my time worrying about idiots. Politics you know? and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, well, again, it's, uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to sit down and have the, the long chat with you about it. Yeah. Kelly writes, Helen, I see from the pic you're a fan of Doctor Who. Who was your favourite Doctor? Were you involved with Doctor Who? Or, uh, I was, yeah. Who? Um, hen yeah, hence the photograph. I was uh, the deputy to the controller of BBC One who brought back Doctor Who. 
Is and the reason, the reason she brought back Doctor Who, I'd like to think, and she, well, she agrees actually, is me, because I was a huge Doctor Who fan. I watched it as a kid in Dublin when we got the free BBC from the overlap yeah, from yeah. Wild. Yeah, and John Pertwee and Tom Baker were my, my um, favourite Doctor Whos. And in fact, I met John, it, usually when you work in television, you'll probably know this, John, being in the media, is that you're never that, you're never that sort of overwhelmed or, you know, fan you know, you know, a real fan girl or boy when you meet your, you know, icons or whatever. It's very, you know, there's so and so in the lift, and there's Graham Norton, and there's a. And I met John Pertwee in the corridor of BBC Pebble Mill, which was in Birmingham, and he was sick. He was everything I thought he would be. You know, he was six foot and charming, and the blonde hair, yeah. grey then. And I was like a child. I was like that five-year-old behind the sofa, you know? So the magic was still there, even though I was only just a 24-year-old researcher or something, you know? Yeah. And I was a mad Doctor Who fan. And even though I went into current affairs and factual, um, I'd walk through the big prop department at the famous uh, television centre, which yeah. they called the, yeah. the Donut in Shepherd's Bush. Yeah. And you'd walk through that to get to the graphics building, which was a big tower. And one day, I remember just looking through the props department and I saw this blue corner, blue, just blue edge. And I went, oh my God. And I walked through what they call the flats, which is basically the flat scenery that they put at the back of every television show. And I buried my way, walked my way through the flats. And here was the TARDIS. Here was the TARDIS. Wow. With, with pigeon poo and you yeah. know, you know, it had been left there. And I remember just looking at it and touching it and thinking, my God, my childhood, you know? Yeah, and, but anyway, I got on the case when I, when I got into, or, or, I'd left RTE, I'd done a few years as a creative director, um, and then I got to get into the small BBC One team in TV Centre, so, which is a small group of people, the controller, the person who deals with the money, the person who deals with the scheduling, and I was her deputy, so I'd help with commissioning and so forth. And I was saying, you know, now is the time to bring back a new Doctor Who. It's been wow. Wow. 12 years off air. You know, we've got yeah. to do this. She wasn't a fan. She wasn't a fan of Doctor Who. She hadn't liked it as a kid. You know, lots of people don't. Yeah. Um, well, you see, Helen, I think, like, you had Pertwee, I had Tom Baker, and then there was a kind of, like, it was it became inferior kind of actor. And yes. sort of... Well, we had the post, we had the post Star Wars. Once you had Star Wars and that, of its time, you had the fabulous, which was then, I suppose, computer-generated imagery. Uh, after that, everything looked cheap, yeah. you know, um, so, and, and it began to fall off and it became a bit more clownish and a bit more, and it was um, the controller Alan Yentob pulled the plug and I think it was the late 80s. Sylvester, so, that guy, was it Sylvester? Yeah, it just looked kind of a bit tacky and yeah. a bit sort of cardboardy sets yeah. and they were right to do it. I think they were right to, to, and then they, of course, they sold the rights to Hollywood to make a film, which wasn't massively successful. No. Of course. No. Um, but my, oh, yeah. she, she finally came in after sort of a month long, our offices were adjoining and I had this little Dalek, which was, I bought it, which uh, had batteries in it and you press, you press it and it would come out with a different Dalek noise every day. Oh, yeah. So it would come out with exterminate, yeah. or, you know, terminate or something like that. You yeah. know that yeah. Limited every, vocabulary to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was only about 10 of them. So every time she'd come in in the morning, I'd be in at about eight, she'd come in about half eight. There was only two of us in the office. And I'd see her coming down the corridor. So I'd just wait and I'd press the button and I'd go, exterminate. <laughs> and she'd go, oh, would you ever feck off? She'd feck off. She got used to my Irish. Now, feck off, Helen, right? Beep. So I'd wait the next day, you know. So th I'd put up with this every day. And she was going, can you stop doing that? And I was going, no, not until you tell me to find out where the rights are. Wow. So I basically bullied her. And... Um, she said, finally, she came in, I think after about probably, probably the 20th push of the button, you know, one more. She said, look, go and find out who has the rights. I'm not promising anything. She said, go and find out who has the rights. Start the ball rolling. Get on to drama. Blah. Yes. Wow. yes. Wow. So, I mean, obviously it took drama yeah. and the fabulous, um, you know, uh, R Russell uh, to, 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 to write it and the brilliant drama team to make it. Um, the tenant as well, the, the guy, was it David Tennant? Well, it was, it was Christopher Eccleston first. Of course, yeah, first yeah. First series, and then David Tennant. But it took about two years from that time, and it was a fantastic time to be on BBC One because we'd get the tapes yeah. back from Cardiff where they filmed it, and we, we, the time we got the first new title sequence with the remade Doctor Who music, oh, yeah, like yeah, a small yeah, team of yeah. about six of us just sat around and was watched it and we were all kids again, you know? <laughs> so that was really, 
magic television time, you know, and... Uh, it's a bit what, like what, what Kathleen Kennedy failed to do, really, in, with Star Wars, didn't it? I mean, you, rebo yes. you rebooted it very successfully, but uh, can, yes. can I ask you what... what are you, do you watch it with the, um, the female Doctor Who? I mean, are you... Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she's fantastic. I mean, if, it, if I'd been... I mean, the thing is, if I'd, been the, if I'd been the controller then, I probably would have gone for a female Doctor. But I think, in retrospect, my boss was right because we had to bring it back. Um, we had to bring it back the way we brought it back. And I think maybe I would have brought in a female Doctor earlier, not just because she's female. I just think the audience was so sort of open and liked it and liked Eccleston and liked Tennant and then like Matthew and like Capaldi that you know it was you know if we handled it well as they did um you know it could have well been accepted two doctors ago uh, and now it's you know it's wonderful it's wonderful I'm just so delighted that she's there and I'll be delighted if it goes back to being a bloke again and yeah. you know yeah. who knows who knows yeah. um Sheila writes, just getting back to the to Monica, uh, congrats on the book and well done for setting up local support. This is localsupport.ie. This is something you also did uh, when lockdown happened. This is for old people. Right, yeah, vulnerable. that was back in, um, just at, as things were coming to a head really in March around Paddy's Day and they were talking about lockdown. And really in my head was, um, you know, if I was in London, if I hadn't come back, how would my aunt get her tablets, get her shopping? You know, there's no national support system. Um, yeah. So I set up, a, the, there's a great woman, um, Samantha, called Tweeting Goddess, and she's um, she put out this tweet that basically said something about, you know, we must support each other, and how can we do this, and uh, hashtag it local support. And I caught up with that and I thought this is a great idea how about we do localsupport.ie and we put the name of our town or village or wherever we are after that so I set one up for where we were at that time in Rush hmm. and then within then I got volunteers joining in a fabulous IT guy Dave Bulger great guy Stephen Holmes John Barrington uh, and you know other Gronia Ferris and different people who came the core team of about seven people suddenly within a few days and within a week, we had 7,000 volunteers and we had an interactive map of where all these volunteers were throughout Ireland. And we were pairing them up. We'd have a few day, we have a few hours each on the phone pairing up. We had a, a generic uh, mobile phone number. So if you needed something, you rang us and we'd pair you up with the person nearest you. Very I mean, you know, somewhere in Dublin, you'd have 100 people around you. You know, say Athlone, you might have six people around you. So in the absence of a government, a state sort of service, uh, local support provided that. And we were on shift all day, wow. only, six of, only six of us, no funds, no anything, in order to sort of bridge the gap um, until the national community call came in. Yeah. And at which point we handed our 7,000 volunteers into the national effort. Okay. So that was, it was just something to bridge we didn't yeah. know there was, we didn't know there was, go I mean, inevitably there was going to have to be some sort of national state effort, but there was a gap and people were panicking and we sort of stepped into that and, and helped people in those scary days in, in March, April. Yeah, um, speaking of scary then, um, Sheila writes, given the calls for a public inquiry to investigate the circumstances related to each death from COVID-19 and nursing COVID in nursing homes, one can only wonder how many of those who died may have survived if they and their families were perhaps able to receive adequate care and support at home. Um, although it is in the programme for government to introduce a statutory scheme to support people to live in their own homes. I'd love to hear Helen and Monica's <laughs> thoughts on the provision of home care in Ireland. Congrats on the book again. Well, that's very nice of you, Sheila. I mean, look, it's it, caring. I, I'm back a wet day, really, in Ireland, and I don't want to be sounding off as if I know more than people who've been caring for people for years and years here. And God knows I've been in touch with many of them, um, hearing their stories on via Twitter. And even in the middle of the night, sometimes I, I'll get a DM and I'm awake and I'll chat to somebody on a DM on Twitter, just somebody who's having a really bad time. I'm not setting myself up as a carer's spokeswoman. Um, you know, all I know is that it takes all your effort and it takes, you know, uh, you know, you get 219 euros a week as a full-time carer. 
um, and you know that is below even what the 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 PPU or whatever it's called the the, the pandemic payment yeah. is. Pandemic, pandemic um, you know that, that that basically pays for me my petrol and um, you know. Uh, you know my my car tax my insurance my mileage you know um to go 25 minutes up the m1 to my aunt you know um so it is by no means something you can live on you know um and that's full time care so even if i was living in the same house as her that's what that's what i'd get um so it's a pretty paltry sum i have to say um and uh you know there's a lot of work and thought needs to go into that and i, I only yesterday I was having a conversation with someone about a possible book that I might might be interested in writing and, and, and drawing on uh, people's experiences around Ireland. Um, you know, there's no one set carer. I happen to be caring for a 90 year old, 91 year old woman. There's, there's, you know, there's lots of variations on the theme of caring. There's people who have kids and are also looking after grandparents or elderly relatives. There are people looking after children who are, you know, severely uh, disabled, um, looking after those with learning disabilities and so forth. So I don't want to, I don't want to really come across as I know everything. I don't, I'm learning it bit by bit. Um, and it's a very, very exhausting, taxing, um, you know, I get phone calls in the middle of the night sometimes if she sets off her, she has one of those wrist things, yeah, you know, yeah. press, and by, you know, by mistake, she presses it and she might ring, it might, it might ring at three in the morning and I won't get back to sleep till seven because my heart is, you know, beating yeah. so much, you know, and uh, there's that sort of stress. There's the stress of um, the interim <clears throat> hours when she might be alone for a couple of hours until I get up there. And actually I won't go into details, but that happened this morning, which meant that I literally ran out of the house with one leg in my jeans, you know, into yeah. the car. Yeah, 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 yeah. It turned out to be okay, but yeah. you know. What had happened? Um, just, what, no, I don't really want to go into yeah, it because it's her privacy and so forth. Of course. But it's just, these are the things you have to be prepared for. And, you know, despite having a structure in place of people who care for her, including myself, that, uh, you know, my plan was to go up at 11 this morning and to be there with her through lunch and whatever. But actually, just we have a WhatsApp group of people who look at, and at nine o'clock, everything was fine. And at 10 o'clock, everything wasn't fine. So, you know, my plans were out the window, straight in, drag, you know, everything. Have I got my keys? Have I got this? Right, right Zoom, you know? Yeah. Um, so I can't plan anything. No, really. no, no, that's the thing. Uh, your entire, you know, your people think, oh, isn't it a nice life? You've got your nice house now and your nice aunt, and she sounds grand. I wish, I wish. I've actually booked a restaurant for Friday week in Dublin, the first time I've been in a restaurant for, like us all, you know, for many a month. And I am bricking it that I, it'll have to change, you know, because I can't predict how she's going to be, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 and nobody yeah. pays you for that sort of money, you know, for, for, yeah. for that sort of thing, you know, where you think, I just love a night where I know this phone doesn't go you know yeah, 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 um, yeah. you know as i said in the book at the end i said I, i'm here with my cat and a mobile phone that doesn't stop ringing which makes me sound like i'm some sort of you know uh pop star or something the phone doesn't stop ringing because it's my aunt you know <laughs> <laughs> she has a mobile phone and she knows how to use it you know and, uh, and you you guys were denied a launch for the book i mean uh, is, would she have loved to would she have loved to the, the Oh, no, nice. launch. There, was never, there was never any question of a launch. I mean, as I said to you, this has all just come out of nowhere. There was no chance of a launch. <laughs> up, up, to the fa up to the moment, two weeks ago, when the Irish Times um, did a little story on me for their weekend section, and they said, can we photograph you, me, mm. and the stair lift? Uh, and I said, yeah, sure, I'll go up to the aunt's house and blah, blah, blah. And I said to the aunt at that stage, and that, at that stage I had the physical book. So I said to her, look, the Irish Times are coming up, they're doing an article on us, and uh, they want to take a photograph of me in the stair lift. She said, what about me? I said, the, whole, the whole point is, I said, you've said you don't want to be named or shown. Yeah. And, ah, no, she said, no, no, no. She said, no, 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 uh, no, I'm not letting you have all the limelight. And I said, right, are you sure about this? You're going to be in this photograph, you're going to be in the Irish Times. You're going, yes, Grant. So he took it, he was lovely, great guy, Alan Betts, the great photographer. And as 
as he was going, he said, um, what name shall I put down for your anonymous? I said, can, Mo, I, I said to her, Monica's her name, obviously. I said, now, you're anonymous, Mona, so there'll be a photograph of you and me. Can we just put your first name? And she went, oh, yes, Monica, you can put Monica. And I said, are you sure? And in fact, it's so much so, I recorded it on my phone. To make sure <laughs> in case people thought, you know, that woman's put her poor aunt, you yeah, know, know, into know. the public eye, you know. Yeah. So just, now she's yeah, thrilled. She's got the article cut out. Anyone who comes in is, I mean, she'll have it laminated next. Anyone who comes into the house is shown it, you know, the, the gas engineer or, yeah. you know, the postman, just, you know. Just left there, you know. So. Yes. So, oh, no, well, not left there. Show it to them, you know. So she, it's a lease of life for her, you know, and she can't wait now to go in to earn it. And we're trying. Uh, Ivan O'Brien has is, is I think getting it into Arnott's because of course Arnott's features a lot in the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love to, what we love to do and love to happen is for me the big thing is she's desperate to go to Arnott's. You know what she does is browse, she doesn't buy, she just browses, you know, and then has the coffee and another little browse. That's all she does. Yeah. So what I'd love to do is bring her in and not say anything and bring her into the basement and in the, the book section and the kitchen section. And she loves the kitchen section and just bring her through the books. And they might have a little table there oh, with the brilliant. photo and the this. And so that's fingers crossed. If our arnets are very good for PR and various things like that, but I'd love to do that for her. Yeah. Not, not, I don't want any cameras or anything like that. I just love to do it for her because that to her would be, oh my God. Well, we'll get this to Arnett's. We'll, get, we'll make sure that we're out of yeah. we, we, we will. Um, Helen, I just want to say it's a, a very great pleasure talking to you. I'd love to. Um, talk longer and maybe way more depth about other stuff that we we, we touched on. But will you send um, a very happy Christmas from all our readers to Monica? I will indeed. And, um, I will. and thank you very much for a good news story from from this horrific year. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it is a good news story. I mean, it has its ups and downs, but like anything. But you know, there's a very very happy ninety one year old lady and. Uh, you know, to me, that's fantastic. You know, we'll make we'll make about you know I'll make enough to bring her on a on a good browsing spree around Arnott's. It's not going to people are convinced like it's going to make millions out of this. Yeah. Okay. Having a laugh. Have you read an Irish publishing contract <laughs> recently? You know, I'll bring her for a good browse and a good buy in Arnott's. That's what we get out of it. You know. That thank sounds, you, John. That's good. Thank you, Helen. Thanks so much. And uh, just to say that the Stairlift Ascends is available in all good bookshops from O'Brien Press. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, John. Thanks so much. Cheers.